Welcome to the DevReady Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by Sunil Godsey. He is the CEO of Intuitionology. Um, they're all about intuition in a brand, uh, quite a fascinating topic and how we make decisions quickly uh, from a, probably a subconscious level, I would imagine, um, around our intuition and do we trust a brand? And today we're going to dig in a little bit on that and get an understanding of what Intuitionology does and how Sun- Sunil offers a few things around understanding what intuition means within a brand. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm really excited to uh, to be here and hoping to drop some no- value uh, bombs today and some knowledge bombs. And, and I'm going to really try and get your listeners uh, and those watching to, to really get in touch with their intuition. What is this thing called intuition? How do we really know what it is? And so I'm going to educate your listeners and watchers uh, mm-hmm. with that today as well. Oh, cool. I'm looking forward to it. So just a, a quick intro to yourself. Um, tell us a bit about who you are, your background, and how you ended up in intuitionology and going down that path. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, former uh, engineer, entrepreneur, management consultant, uh, now author, speaker, uh, and and the journey kind of between all those careers kind of started with uh, with a book that I wrote called Fail Fast, Succeed Faster. It's my very first book. And the premise of that book was that if I wrote stories from those who failed, then conceptually those reading it should be able to succeed faster because here's here's 75 stories of failure. Um, and so that was a premise. And the one thing I get, kept getting asked on stages around the world was, Sunil, tell me the one thing that's going to make me succeed as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I used to roll my eyes saying, okay, come on. Yeah, I didn't come here with a cue card or like a PDF sheet. Like I'm holding a 400-page book here. Yeah. You know, with, with 286 people I've interviewed, 75 stories of failure. So no, there isn't that one thing uh, until I went back to the audio recordings And what I did is I put my hat on, which was to answer one question. What was the difference between success and failure? Mm -hmm. And if I thought from that lens, let's take a look at those audio recordings again. And to my surprise, 80 to 90% of the business executives or entrepreneurs use some form of, I should have trusted my gut. I should have used my intuition. I knew what the right decision was, but I ignored it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. There's there's this tie, this thread of intuition that I just never picked up on mm. uh, on my first book. And so that got me thinking, okay, when did intuition kind of work for me? And so if I go back to when I was five years old, there were these video games that I wanted my to buy. My dad said they're too expensive. And I distinctly remember this voice, loud voice saying, Sunil, go door to door to raise money. And that's exactly what I did. I went door to door. I had my two and a half year old brother in tow in diapers. Uh, and luckily, nothing happened to him uh, while I'm trying to collect this money. And lots of milk and cookies later, I raised $200 and $100 went to my dad. And the other $100 went to charity because my school was doing that time. And I love that. So that was my first quote unquote brush with, with uh, intuition. And what happens, though, is as we start to age, we got people who like some of us go through trauma. We've got people who judge us. We've got people who give us advice who have, who have no they don't really care about what we want. And all of a sudden, those that intuition gets dampened and dampened because we start to think from the opinions and beliefs and frankly, the values of other people. Uh, and, and that certainly happened to me as well. And so even though my intuition throughout my my years is saying, you know, everything I was doing was entrepreneurial in nature, you know, whether I got involved in a bake sale or some marketing campaign or sales, I always excelled at that stuff. And I had a number of mini businesses along the, uh, along the way, which is just screaming entrepreneurship to me. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, when I reflect back, you know, my very first career, uh, there, uh, being an East Indian male, there's four career doors that you can think about. It's, it's doctor, lawyer, engineer, or failure. And that's it, right? <laughs> and so I, I, I'm thinking entrepreneur. Well, that's door number four. That's failure. That's the one I want. And then there's my dad, who's the engineer, saying, no, no, no. You need to be, uh, you need to follow societal rules. You know, subconsciously, you got to be an East Indian. You got to pick one of the three doors. And so because he was an engineer, I went into engineering and I hated it. Uh, you know, I spent three years in a career that I loved aspects of it, which was really, really good. But two years into that career, there was a Mexican restaurant chain that was coming up, a huge one that was coming up to Canada. And I got in a chance to be a private investor. Uh, and so I took it. And pretty soon, within one year, I was making five times more in dividends doing that than working full time as an engineer. So in year, year three, I quit. 
And I never, my, my dad said, I'm not speaking to you again for, and that happened for years. Um, but I was doing what I loved. And so next thing I know, I had $20 million in revenues at a wholesale clothing company, retail clothing company, pop-up event company, entertainment company. Uh, and so it, I, I absolutely loved where my life was going and then got into management consulting once people heard of the success mm-hmm. I had. Uh, and then I remember there was this one giant contract in Silicon Valley and the amount of money they were going to pay me was a, a, a stupendous. It was, a, it was huge. And yet every time I got the contract back, because we had to have a visa coming from Canada to the U.S., the terms kept changing in these contracts. They kept updating. And so I phoned down to the legal and the HR department saying, what's going on? And so as they're, they're talking, I, I didn't believe them. My intuition is saying something wrong, something's wrong with that story. But I was so emotionally entangled with the dollar amount that they were going to pay me that I spent every single penny to go down there and they never paid Her. me. And so I came back up to Canada broke. I had 23 cents in my bank mm-hmm. account. My wife luckily is from India. So she's phoning, phoning me. I'm coming up against the US Canadian border driving back to Calgary, Canada. And she's saying, how are things going? And I said, oh, great. You know, just going back to Canada to settle in. Meanwhile, I don't even know where I'm going to be sleeping that night. And so perhaps the most devastating of all situations was when I was in engineering, I was doing some personal coaching mm-hmm. at the time. And I had a friend reach out to me. She was being stalked at the time. And she was saying, Sunil, I really, really, really need your advice. And so my intuition is very strong signal was saying, meet with her that afternoon. And I had a couple of buddies convince me, come on, see, let's go for beers. So I went against my intuition and I told her, do you want to meet a couple of days later? Do you mind? And she goes, no, no, that's fine. And the very next day, that same stalker walked up to her to a bush shelter and put a bullet through her forehead. Oh, God. And so now I'm thinking, oh, oh now I really, really need to figure out this thing called Didn't intuition. expect that story. And Dave. so that's quite a shock. Yeah, it, yeah, it was it was mm. jarring. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was going like this is where I'm mm. going back and thinking, oh, my God, like the times that I ignore my intuition and, and I lost a good friend. Mm. So I really need to figure this out because I don't want this to happen not only to me, but all these other people who are ignoring their intuition. I don't want it to happen. I don't want that to happen mm-hmm. to them. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do is because I came from an engineering background is at the time that I was looking at intuition, then it came from sort of, you know, sort of uh, people would call this woo woo manifestation voices from God uh, and that sort of angle of intuition. And although I respect that angle of people have that to me, that just didn't fulfill my definition. Like I needed something a little bit more tangible. So I went to a neurologist, a buddy of mine, and I said, look, can I interview you on intuition? And he said, sure. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I don't know how much science is here. Uh, I, I think this is going to be like a five minute interview. So I put like only a 25 cents in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, the, the time thing, because I think this is going to be a short interview. And I go to his hospital where he's, he's practicing. I turn on the camera and I said, okay, Michelle, uh, does, uh, does intuition exist? And he goes, it absolutely does. We all have a sixth sense. Uh, more and more neuroscience is, is showing up, showing that it's it's happening much earlier than we're consciously aware of it. And he's, he's talking about the mm-hmm. gut and he goes on to talk about how he uses it with his patients. And I'm like stunned. And so I said, okay, so Dr. Rathbone is talking about this neuroscience research. Where is it? So I go to an academic database. I type in the word intuition and I'm expecting, you know, 15, 20 articles, maybe 30 if I'm lucky. And I've got, you know, my nice notepad ready to take, you know, a few names down. 53,000 articles from 1990 on intuition, more than half, more than two thirds of it on relationships, more than half on business and entrepreneurship. And there's even more on sales and marketing, HR, leadership. And it's been studied like mad. And so there's these MRIs I've been seeing. And so I said, wow, here's a bunch of proof, well, correlation Mm. now that intuition kind of exists. And so some of the really, really key ones that I looked at was that intuition, uh, you know, one of the things I had a hard time was defining it. Uh, You know, what was it? It wasn't manifestation. I needed to define it my own way. And when I look at the MRIs, when you use your intuition, intuition hits the amygdala, which is the base of your brain. That's the fight or flight area. There is no capacity for language. And so in, for my podcast interview, when I, and I've got two of them, one on the intuitive branding side, which we'll talk about, and the intuitionology one, which is more the personal one about relationships. Every single time I ask uh, an interviewee about the definition of intuition, they all have their own definition. And that makes perfect sense because this is their intuition. It's how they think it comes uh, about, right? And that's where the amygdala comes into, into effect. 
The other thing that I also realized is that when I had it at five years old, perhaps we were born with it. And so lo and behold, there's this paper that shows that infants as young as two months old have been shown to have intuitive capabilities or what this paper calls intuitive physics. Um, and then with Dr. Rathbone saying that it happens much earlier than we actually are able to, con we're consciously aware of it. Two papers that I saw showed that intuition happens seven to 10 seconds before we actually make a decision or take an action. And when it comes to trust, which is what I talk about when it comes to intuitive branding, two older papers said that trust is developed within 10 to 14 seconds. And a recent paper I looked at three weeks ago that came out of the UK showed that trust was developed intuitively within 33 milliseconds. That's how quick you establish trust. And when it comes to businesses, establish trust in the workplace with customers, with the brand, 33 milliseconds. And so my tagline, if you go to sunilgodsey.com, is crush your competition in under 14 seconds. Well, I'm giving you a benefit of the doubt that <laughs> you, you've got 33 milliseconds to 14 seconds. I'm giving you some slack, but under 14 seconds, mm -hmm. if you don't establish a two-way trusted relationship based on intuition, because intuition is where trust is developed, nobody wants to work for you. Um, and nobody wants to buy from you. And the marketplace thinks you're terrible. And if you're the one that uses what I call intuitive branding, which looks at intuition in leadership and with your customers and your, your, uh, your employees, which is what I do, and that's what I coach uh, businesses to do, then employees want to work with you. And the turnover rates go down significantly. Productivity rates go high. Customers want to buy from you and they start buying more and in larger volumes and quantities. And the marketplace loves you because now the signal is that this is a company that that everybody's loving. And because so many people, so many businesses are not doing it, 99.99% of businesses are stuck doing it the old way. That's why you can crush the competition in 33 milliseconds effectively. And so there's all this science that I had and saying like, wow, okay. So if I've got this science, um, how, do, how do people actually communicate? And so I interviewed over 1,000 people, and now I'm up to 1,300, actually. Um, That's a lot of data points. And so what I found yes. is that... <laughs> I've got a lot of questions coming at you, but continue. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. No problem. No problem. And so the way that intuition yes. communicates with you is through these things called mm -hmm. signals, intuitive signals. And there's positive and negative. It's very basic. Positive and negative. It's just, remember, amygdala. You're going to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, and that's a negative intuitive signal, or you're not. And that's a positive intuitive signal. And we can talk about fear uh, a little bit later because fear is one of the things that kiboshes your ability to move through that uh, and, and listen to your signal. But we all have a unique signals. So, for example, the positive ones for me are a feeling of flow, the dots connecting. Um, and I had this, the CEO that actually sees this omen pop up on his right shoulder. No color, no shape, but he's grown two multi-million dollar businesses based on him doing business deals. This omen pops up. He stops negotiation and says yes to whatever it is, hiring, vendor, uh, VCs, whatever it is, he says yes. And so uh, he was uh, one of the top online retailers in Canada. Now he's gone into bespoke clothing online. Again, two multi-million dollar businesses. The latest one is, is going nuts worldwide um, based on an omen. So that's off a, off a feeling, an omen, right? It's a f so, feeling, an omen, yes. his signal, mm. right? His signal. Mm -hmm. And the negative signals, and what's particular about the negative signals is they actually start very subtle in nature. And they're saying, okay, I'm showing you a subtle signal. Don't make that decision. And when you start to ignore that, those subtle signals start to get louder. And they start changing until it, they no longer you can no longer ignore them. And I had one person who was in a bad relationship. She actually heard the words, get out. And there was a this the CEO of a nine-figure company in the back of an Uber. His intuition was saying he needed to quit. And he ignored it, ignored it, got louder and louder. He's sitting at the back of the Uber, Uber and it just blurts out, I quit. It just came out. And so then he walks into his boardroom and he says, it's my time to go. Uh, I, I just, I know it's the next chapter. Now he can't say it's intuition. I mean, he has to use a nice boardroom <laughs> speak to justify it, yep. but, yes. uh, but he quit and that was the right time uh, for him. He knew, mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, and so these are some of the negative signals. I was interviewing another entrepreneur and he said, Sunil, you know what? Nobody's ever asked me that question. I mean, it's not as if, you know, Anthony and Andrew, you and I go for lattes and say, hey, you know, let's have a latte. What are your intuitive signals? You're probably saying this Sunil guy's a bit bizarre. Uh, right, because it's not typically what I, I'd come. So, so you're framing it like everyone's signals are different, right? So and just the tuning in and big building awareness around what they are. Absolutely. The question I have then is the whole int- intuition around trust within a brand. How do you frame that when you've got everyone's triggering off different signals and different intuition, and they've got their own trust centers and own things firing? How do you find a brand that fits? everybody or is it not about fitting everybody how does that explain that to me yeah absolutely so so intuition Mm. is is when you look at trust so if you look at you walk into a room or you see a a a brand let's say you're looking at a marketing message and you you, and and here's a really good example i was just in a furniture store uh over the weekend uh and we were taking a look at uh some furniture obviously and so the salesperson was really really good and then what the the card that i got was uh, it was I saw the card and then I got a, a little sticky with this guy's name on it. Let's kind of slanted. Now this was a, a, a furniture manufacturer that is pretty well known and the quality is pretty good. But yet here's this employee that it, it looks like you know I don't know if this employee just got got hired or did that employee like is he new or and then what type of advice am I going to get? Am I going to get you know screwed here? So my intuitions ask going through all these kind of things. So even if this this company had a certain brand in mind, the the the, the first point of contact for me it was a bit of mistrust here, and so because the customer journey wasn't very smooth. Um, you know, I had another, uh, I was getting my car mm-hmm. fixed uh, and it's an Audi and Audi's, uh, you know, when you get Audi, you're supposed to have a little bit of customer service, um, a little bit better customer service. I was sitting there getting, you know, I think it was my oil changed and, and tire changed. Um, and there were four other customers and the, the secretary was just sitting there, the admin was, was sitting there and playing Sudoku and didn't address any of us. Now, I'm not expecting the red carpet treatment, but just, hello, would you like a bottle of water? Um, you know, that small thing it could be the difference between me buying another Audi and not. And I actually brought this up to the service manager. And I said, you guys are, and then they texted me and they texted me with some, hi, Sunil Godse, how was your, uh, how was your visit? And I said, Sunil Godse, boy, oh boy, that's pretty archaic. And so I brought it up. I said, you guys are treating me like a number. And so I got some, some rigmarole about some systems, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, oh, so you are treating me like a number, right? And so, and I talked about this on one of my lives that, you can't treat customers like that. If you want me to buy another Audi, if you want me to buy a piece of furniture, if you want me to buy your product or service, treat me like a person because I'm trusting that customer journey down. So whatever product you have, let's say it's a marketing campaign. Let's say you stop the scroll. And I had Brendan Kane on here who's famous for getting 1 million followers in 30 days. And we talked about the stop the scroll. You can stop the scroll, which is really good. What You can get great and cheesy on Instagram and Facebook. But my whole customer journey is about stopping the scroll and saying, okay, my intuition is picking up on saying, does these products and services that this company offers match what they're saying, match what they're advertising? And anywhere down that chain, if there's a mismatch, my intuition is going, ah, 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 there is something wrong here. And I'm bouncing. <laughs> And I'm not only am I bouncing, so are other people that I don't know. And there are other people I do know that I may talk about. And so now you've got more expensive marketing because it's six times more expensive to bring in a new customer than it is to service an existing customer. Uh, and it's all based on that stuff. And, and case in point, I, I had a, a one company that I was helping out. Uh, it was struggling, about $400,000. And was going, it was, it was tanking pretty quickly. Uh, and at that time, I was known as a turnaround expert. So, um, and I kind of knew one of the, the co-CEOs. He said, Sunil, we really need some help. So I told him, you have, if you have to, uh, by contract, you have to agree, you leave me alone with my decisions and I'll, and, and hopefully I'm going to help you. Uh, first meeting, I'm, it was so apparent that there was no trust between the employees and the, co- the co- two co-CEOs. And you, you're looking at things like body language. You're looking at the tone of the questions. You're looking at the type of the questions. Mm-hmm. How do they word it? And all these are clues that I'm using that my intuition is picking up on saying, there is no trust here. If there's no trust here, these employees, oh, they're spending more time looking at where their next job is than helping this company grow. And so the first thing I did with a struggling company uh, they, they were hard with cash. Uh, the first thing I do is buy all new equipment, 
because the equipment is so old and I raised all the salaries. And I'm, I'm not talking about like these guys were so underpaid. I gave them something that was respectable and then a little bit for the respect. So I'm just giving you market value to these people. They'll, they felt so valued. And not only that, I started bringing them in and listening to them to say, how do we improve this process, this, uh, this process? How do we improve the customer journey? And I've got all this input. I'm using their input. I'm listening to them using all their creativity. And we're actually implementing this stuff to the point now that we've stabilized and it got me the chance to actually expand. And so when I could expand, that's the creative side, all the backfilling, all the processes were all filled by the employees because they trusted me. And so we went from $400,000 and a downward uh, spiral quickly to three and a half million dollars. And we were probably about to make 10 million the next year before I, but I, 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 uh, I left. Um, and consequently, those two co-CEOs went back to the old ways of doing things after I left, and they imploded in six months, even though I gave them a $10 million roadmap, all mm. because of trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens. And, and that trust is because, you know, and you still have to have processes. You still have to have data. You still have to have your financials. That does not go away. But it starts with that trusting relationship to say, I like this management team. I'm going to produce more for them because I want to produce and if you want stats, if you look at the Edelman report, they're saying a 37% boost in productivity. If you have a trusted environment, 31% goes to the bottom line. So just by having a trusting relationship, more or less, you're hitting the bottom line almost 100%. Yeah, that's a big and number. If you, and if you look yeah. at customers, look at all our buying behavior. Like, and I gave you just a couple of mine. When did you walk away from a product or service or a company? What maybe it was something they said on Twitter or something statement they put out. Nike does this really uh, a lot. So yes, you're going to lose some people with some of the statements, but you're also going to gain some others that have that value in them. And so, and some people will falsely, some of the management will falsely say, no, 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 we can't, we can't get involved in the BLM movement or uh, like Black Lives Matter or you know, <laughs> put a stand. Um, and I'm not advocating for one or the other. This is not a political statement whatsoever. But at the same time, if you do put something that su is supported culturally you're going to attract people that have values. And, and now we're going to look at core values because the core values need to be feeling-based. How, how does it matter to me what this company does? And if it matters, I'm going to want to work for you. And so if you look at the millennial generation, uh, one thing you can look at is people say they're lazy. Um, I have a different slant. I'm just saying that these, the, the Gen Zs, the Gen Zs, they want to go to a place that's going to value them. And because most businesses don't, because they treat that relationship transactional, that's why you go from in my in my uh, generation, uh, the baby boomers, twelve year stint at one company on average. Then you go to the Gen X is three point nine, three point two, and it's going down and down because people like me in management positions don't want to change. And so if people like me don't want to change, nobody wants to work for me. So it's not yep. anybody else's fault but mine. Mm. And all I'm doing is just being empathetic, treating somebody like a person. And one of the things, one of the questions I had on another podcast was, well, how can CEOs be empathetic? Uh, you know, uh, and I said, well, do they have a family? Probably. Do they have kids? Perhaps. Do they have friends they go out for for beers or coffee? Yeah. Okay, they're empathetic. Why is it all of a sudden that we walk into a door and we shut that empathetic, uh, uh, that empathetic feeling off? Because... We just want to treat people like people, like just get to know your employees. I'm not saying, you know, hug them and have a big kumbaya, uh, but that's what that two-way trusted relationship is. And so if I'm being authentic, I'm being, uh, you know, true to my words. I don't, uh, you know, my actions match my, uh, uh, my words. Uh, and I really care. The, other, the intuition of others is going to pick up on that says, yes, uh, it, he does uh, or she does um, speak and they're very, she or she is very genuine. I really want to work with that person. And intuition's always on. So I can be, uh, you know, uh, something may happen six months down the line and I may take a left turn somewhere, but the intuition of others are watching. And sometimes you'll see this with management, management changes, um, you know, or directional changes. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you go from employees feeling like 3D people down to 2D because somebody else comes in and treats them pretty badly. Mm. Um, and then you're done. Uh, frankly, you're done. And it's just a matter of time, in my opinion. So 
key takeaway from what I'm hearing is caring is a, is a factor here. I'm treating people like people. You've mentioned a couple of times in the conversation around the service um, at the car dealership, what that meant like, but you weren't being treated like a person, like a number. Um, the other thing you mentioned as well was values and tapping into people's values. Uh, there's a couple of things there. So from what I'm seeing and hearing is intuition is really aligned to do I trust this person? Do I feel like they care about me? Is that where you're getting to here? Yeah. Do they do they care enough mm-hmm. about me to mm-hmm. solve? So from a customer perspective, it's going to be, do their, do their products and values really solve a problem for me that I care about? And so many companies are about, this is what this product does. These are the features. I, I don't care about that. I mean, there are other competitors. What problem are you solving for me? Right. Uh, even s- something commoditized like ketchup, for example, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it, like ketchup, you might think, oh, well, you just buy ketchup. Yeah, but I buy Heinz, for example, because maybe my, my, my parents bought it. And so when I grew up around the table and we had this thing called ketchup that we wanted to have on, on fries or whatever chips, as they say in, in Britain, um, I, I put Heinz on there because that was sort of my the, it brings, you know, senses of family. But Heinz did something here in Le- this place called Leamington, Ontario. Uh, and uh, basically, they came in and they cut all the salaries. And uh, one of my buddies actually worked uh, in, in one of the factories there. And they say, they were, we're not treating people like people. It's all about the bottom line. We're, we're getting rid of this, that, the other. And they really made it a cold environment. My buddy left. And they decimated that factory and that community. So I said, wow, that does not fit with my values. And I switched to another Canadian brand called French's. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's still ketchup. Mm-hmm. It's still two dollars and thirty nine cents and two dollars and thirty eight cents. But the value around what they did changed my buying behavior. And now I have ketchups, uh, French's in my uh, in my fridge, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm not alone. There are other people that are doing that. So now you, here's where these values come mm-hmm. in, the actions that you do. Uh, that really matter from a customer's perspective. And so now you're getting sort of from an employee's perspective, now you're getting it from the customer's perspective. And the, the other thing with employees is when you engage them, they're the ones that are going to bring the productivity. They're the ones that are going to make the, the customers feel really, really good because they're the frontline workers. So when, when you're taking care of your employees, which is what leadership should be about, uh, then they will take care of the rest for you because they want to. And time and time again, you get companies like that, Southwest Airlines, uh, WestJet up in Canada. Uh, and, you know, I've had a couple of companies that I worked for that I loved working for, and, and we were darlings. And you know, customers would want to work for people. Even when I sold suits, I mean, when I was in engineering, uh, I had never sold anything. And I got to work at a, a men's clothing store called Tip Top Tailors. I had no sales experience, and my brother was actually selling, because that's how I got in. And pretty soon, uh, I think within a year, I was like third highest in Western Canada in dollar per hour. And everybody's patting my back. But all I did was establish relationships. So for to give you a quick example, there's one CEO that comes on a Saturday that's like all bothered by, um, you know, the traffic. And he's very, very busy. And I say, well, I know what you like. I know the style that you like. I know you like to have suits when they first come in. Let me shift your purchases on Wednesday. I'll set three aside that I know you love. Pair it with some shoes and, and ties and all that. Give them a call. Hey, listen, Jean, it's ready. Uh, come on in Wednesday. I'm working. Uh, you're in and out in half an hour. Comes in. I like all three. Gone. <laughs> and he will never buy from anybody else. He never bought in the two and a half years I was there from anybody else. Even though there's, you know, we we're all commissions. So everybody's trying to get in. Mm. and say, no, nope, if Sunil is not there, I will not come and buy. That's just a small example of what happens when you really care. And I cared for these guys, right? I cared for the customer. And they knew that. Yeah, I was selling stuff. Yeah, was I making money yeah of course i was but what the primary driver was that is that i cared for the customer enough that i wanted to have that relationship and there's what that trust was developed right from his perspective and mine so in in essence you're looking to obviously care for the customer yeah you know, but care for your people too i think um yeah in business it comes from top down like you said if the the business is driving just off the bottom line and not really treating their people like people or engaging in their people um, or looking to help them grow within the business as well. I think there can be some like gaps there. And obviously, if they're not happy in the in, in their current environment, they're not going to be serving the customers in a caring way, like you said there. So um, there will be a bit of that rubbing through on their interactions with the customer. Um, so if I'm listening in and running a business, um, what are 
three things I should be looking at within my business and realm of things that I'm doing right now um, to see if I'm actually, if my employees are, are, are caring enough or if I've got the right messages around values. What are some of the things I could action from this conversation? Well, how do you know you're building the right yeah, trust? There's a couple of things there. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so one of the very, very first things I do with any kind of leadership team or with with an mm -hmm. entrepreneur is I optimize, optimize their, their intuition. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I optimize it is that these intuitive signals are actually powered by four types of intuition. Mm -hmm. And the best way that I can explain all these four types is actually through a case study of taking a from a, a non-believer of intuition into a believer within an hour. And so one of my friends uh, he was a big guy in, in the uh, uh, space. Uh, um, he was a, a banker and this guy, like data, spreadsheets, um, you know, as an investment banker, that ruled the world for him. So when I was saying, hey, listen, John, his name is John Rothschild. I just, I want to interview you on intuition. He goes, come on, Sunil, that stuff doesn't exist. What the hell are you talking about? And he says, come on down. You know what? I'll give you an hour. I haven't seen you in a long time. We'll talk about this intuition for five minutes. And we'll catch up with the rest of the time. And so I'm driving down to Toronto. I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be a very fun interview. So I actually turn on the cameras. I tell him about the CEO that, that sees omens and some others that have pulsating earlobes that are hot and stuff. And, and so from his perspective, he thinks like the woo-woo stuff. And he goes, oh, you know what, Sunil, respectfully, um, I'd like to shake that guy's hand that uh, sees omens. But um, okay, look. When you make decisions, it is based on experience and learning. And so now here comes the education. One of the four types of intuition is called experiential intuition. And so if you look at your brain like an iceberg, 90% the subconscious is below water. The 10% above water is the conscious. Every single day since you were born, all your learning, both formal and informal, all your experiences, good and bad, all get put into the subconscious area of, um, of your brain like a library. So when you're about to make a decision, you have billions and billions and billions of data points saying, Sunil, you made that decision sometime in the past and that worked really well. I'm going to send you a positive signal. Andrew, you made a, oh, that, that decision like that did not make sense last time. And when you made that decision, something bad happened. I don't want you to repeat that again. I'm going to give you a negative signal. And so, and then what I was telling John is that sometimes your, your intuition has you go against the data. And he goes, well, Sunil, that's very funny you mentioned that uh, because he had a story to share. And I said, please share this, John. And so he goes, so John was in the, in, uh, in the franchise business. So like McDonald's mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Wendy's, Dunkin' Donuts, all these franchises. And his team would look at a 10 out of 10 scale as a benchmarking system. And a 9 out of 10 meant that you put a franchise in. And, and they looked at demographics and development in the area, traffic patterns. Uh, and so that's how they analyzed it. And there, there was what this really crappy area of Toronto where his team looked at it and they assessed it at a 5.5 out of 10. And now we're going to get into the second of the two called situational intuition. This is where you walk in. We've all been there. We walked into a room. We go, huh, something's not right. And so in John's case, he walks into this area of Toronto and he's got this folder that says five and a half out of 10. And he just says to his business partner, I, I think we should be putting a location here, despite what the team says. He goes against what his intuition, his team says. He puts a location there. That ends up being the most profitable of franchises called the beer market under all of the portfolio he had. And so now John's kind of mm -hmm. getting in. He's, seeing, he's even saying that some, maybe perhaps that was intuition. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I was going to ask that question when you, before you got there because our past experiences are not always the best place to make decisions from. And they're ours, right? Someone else next to us might have completely different experiences and make completely different decisions. So um, doesn't mean someone's right or wrong. It's just the experience you went through. Um, so making decisions just from there can actually limit you in my experience. Absolutely. And this is yeah. why this is really, really important to kind of get your sense of what your what your signals are, your positive negative signals. And uh, in, in John's case, when he like there was a time where he wanted to leave investment banking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and so this is where you, uh, the, the third of the four called relational intuition. This is where the people around you are so important. And so everybody who is concerned about money, fame, ego, private jets, limousines, high-end restaurants, 
all of them, all of them, uh, them said because John wanted to actually start a business. They said, "You're nuts! You're stupid! What are you doing?" The only person that mattered, and this is where relational intuition comes in, because your relational intuition picks up on people who really care about what you want. Who's they're not yes people. These are people who will give you the constructive criticism, but their goal is to make you successful in your path to success. So in John's case, only one person remained. That was his wife. And his wife simply asked him, why do you want to do this, John? Uh, and John now is fully talking about this, saying, Sunil, look, and I'm paraphrasing. This is an hour, an hour before John saying this the intuition stuff does not exist. Like, what the hell are you talking about, buddy? And now he's saying to his wife, sometimes you could have all the data, but you have to trust your intuition. And his wife goes, so what's the decision? He goes, this just feels mm. right. It's That's the feeling. intuitive signal. Mm. And then the fourth, and the fourth one is creative intuition. Creative intuition helps you make the ultimate decision. And so in John's case, it, and if you're like, let's say you're eating a sandwich or you're turning left at the lights. I mean, that's not very creative. Your creative intuition it, it, it was pretty low. And you would think in John's case that this guy had so much experience running businesses as an investment banker that he would pick a company with great revenues, strong balance sheet, healthy cash flows. Nope. His intuition says, John, you're going to run this tiny, almost bankrupt restaurant. That's what you're going to do. And so he listens to his intuition and he says, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Three to $4 million a year gone. He quits that job, walks into that tiny bankrupt little restaurant. That restaurant ended up being a company of franchise brand location called Eastside Mario's. That was location number one. And over the next 20 years, he grew that to over $2 billion a year before <laughs> he retired, all because it felt right. That is the power of intuition when it comes to business. That's when it comes to relationships with the trust. And it had to be, it had to be the right franchisees. It had to be the right management people. It had to have a menu that the customers would love. So that's the two-way trusted relationship that they have, it would have in a brand that people kept coming back to Eastside Mario's and back to the beer market and back to things like Casey's and the Devil's Another one called the Devil's Kitchen or something like that. But these were the brands that he had uh, established. And, and so there's the trust in the customers. There's a trust in the employees. There's the trust from the management because he depended on them. There's your trifecta. And guess what? The marketplace loved what they wanted. And how do you crush the competition? Well, you grow something to $2 billion in 20 years. That's how you do it, right? That's stats Jesus. for you. Mm. Yeah. Now, you mentioned one thing uh, probably about 10, 15 minutes ago about optimizing intuition. What does that mean? Um, and how can one tune in to their own intuition? It's probably something I'd ask because uh, you're, ask, you're asking pertinent questions around how they've made decisions in the past and you're trying to open up possibilities and thinking I'm imagining here. Um, is there a certain process that you take people through here? Absolutely. So, we'll, so what I do with each of the, uh, the executives is I'll take each one of those four buckets, the four types. Uh, and so they're always going to be strongest in one. And that's great. Yes. That just means that they're weakest in the other three. So what I would do is take them back to the decision. Let's say they're weak. They're very strong in experiential intuition and they lean heavily on the experience and learning. And that's great. We need to do that. But then that means they're weaker in the situational intuition, the relational one, and then the, the creative one. So I'll take them back to the times where they dealt with people. And I'll take a look at, okay, what worked and what didn't work when it came to trusting people? And what did you feel like in the moment? And so they're going to get an inventory of intuitive signals for each one of those four buckets. And what we do is we keep working on them until they get a robust set of positive and negative signals for each one of those four types. And we also want to figure out, you know, I mean, Sinex uh, has this thing, you know, uh, why, you know, you kind of want to find out what your why is, but there's actually not just one why, there's four whys. What, which of these four, what are the whys in each one of those buckets? Right? What's, what's the why that you had in the past learning experience that got you to this company? What's the why with the people you deal with? What's the why in the situations you get yourself with? And what, why do you make certain decisions? And there are four whys, and, and we really have to dig deep to figure out what those are. And so once we work on each of those four types and we get their inventory of signals, now they have these basket of signals. They have this, this wealth of feelings that they can they can. Uh, they can tap into. So no matter what business situation in they're in, no matter what 
person they deal with, no matter what experience, uh, the, the situation they're in that, that needs them to look back in the experience or whatever decision they, they meet, need to make, which are the four types, they already have a signal attached to it. And it's very simple. You're going to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or you're not. You're either going to be making a great, a great business decision or you're not. And the biggest thing that I find with executives and people in their personal life is this thing called fear. Fear of change, fear of the unknown, uh, fear of failure. You know, and that doesn't doesn't everyone have some for, sort of fear attached? But everybody has, and and so the the simplest answer I can give is that mm -hmm. when you know what your inventory of signals are, and that fear comes up, you have to think, okay, is that a negative signal or a positive signal? And if you've done your homework, you'll know instantly. And an excellent case study I have with this is there's a fellow by the name of David Dame who's in a wheelchair all his life with uh, cerebral palsy going on beaches and he could never go on the sand. He always says, I wish, I wish, I wish. And there comes a time his intuition says, you got to do it. Now's the time. And so he says, I'm going to do it. So he gets his wife and his friends to wheel him up to that edge where uh, he gets the water in the sand, just caressing his toes. He says, oh my God, this is my dream. And then he falls flat into the water. And the fear starts, the judgment, mm. the failure. What are people going to think? I'm going to look stupid. Uh, and then he says, Sunil, I have two things I can do at that moment. The first thing is I can succumb to that fear, sit back in that wheelchair and forever regret turning my dream into a reality. I am right here. Or I can listen to that intuitive signal saying, come on, David, you can take a step in the water. And he overcomes that fear and takes the one step. And the next one is, come on, David, you can do another one. And then another one. And he overcomes that fear. And then he points to his chin. He says, the water gets up to the chin area. And then he looks back and he's blown away by how far he came. So in a business context, mm -hmm. that fear of how, how you want to lead your company, when you lead with trust with your employees and your customers, you'll be blown away by how far you're able to accelerate your success, how far you're able to accelerate your productivity, how much of a darling you become in the industry, because it happens. And the thing that you have to do is when you have this fear and you're moving in intuition, you have to actually take action. And there's something that I call opportunity cost. Yeah, you can have intuition, but you may not take the action that's you required. Have to listen yeah, you get to listen. it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But and I think what you're doing here, just to summarize, is putting awareness on the categories and giving people awareness of the signals, which when they actually come up, they'll associate and then get an understanding of what that is rather than, oh, I feel a bit different or it doesn't feel right or... Yeah, and not having that awareness. So as soon as you bring awareness on something, it makes it a lot easier for someone to react a little bit differently than they may have in the past. Absolutely. And, and you know, some of these things are going to take time. So take time, right? If it's an important decision, like once you get used to it, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's easy for me to connect the dots because obviously uh, I've been doing this a long time and, and this is what I've been studying and researching. So for me, intuition is pretty quick. Um, but there are times where if I've got a major marketing decision or I'm making a, a, we're putting another product together, I need to think about that, talk with my team and say, okay, does, where's this map with the strategy? And I got to map it. But I'm quickly able to map out the, the paths and I can visually see the path and I can see, okay, is there a positive or negative signal? Ah, that's positive. Go to the next uh, pod. Positive. Third one. Mm, that's a little uncomfortable. So if that's uncomfortable, either that's a bad decision or I need more information around that. So maybe there's a mentor I need to tap into, a colleague I need to call or email to say, okay, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Once I get educated around that, then either that's still a negative signal or it's a positive one. Mm -hmm. So I'm. that's how I operate when okay. I'm making decisions for my mm -hmm. company. And it's very, very practical as well. Really just decision making based off variables then? That uh, it is, yeah, because intuition is your decision, right? You're going to make a decision that's right or wrong. It's, it's all about decision making, but it's the type or the quality of the decision. So, and again, if it's the, the amygdala, the next thing you're going to make is a decision. And, and it's very, very simple. It's either a, it's a good decision mm -hmm. uh, or it's a bad one. And, and you got to make sure that if it's good, who says it's good? Are you saying it's good or is everybody else around you saying it's good? So it's good for them. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not good for the company. And so this is where it's really important mm -hmm. to figure out what are your signals and don't get caught in, you know, having, you know, kind of the group think, right? Mm -hmm. and, and one of my friends is, um, uh, he used to be CEO and chairman of McDonald's Canada. Uh, and he was president of uh, McDonald's Mexico at one time. One of the things he absolutely hated was these, uh, you know, when they would have people come in and test the product. 
um, you, you know, and he would hate them. And he says, because what happens is somebody's going to take a bite of a product and they're looking to everybody else for their reaction. You don't get their reaction. If somebody hates McDonald's pizza, which is a, which is a new thing, you're going to take a look at how they scrunch their face right away. That's what you got to be looking at uh, is their initial reaction. Is that comfortable or not? And that will give you an indication whether that product is good or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you when you have a bunch of people, somebody's saying, yeah, it's gross, but everybody else is enjoying it. Yeah, it's not bad, right? And then they fill out the yeah, survey. Yeah, we quite easily, aren't we? Yes, to fit into, fit into a crowd, yes. Yes. Exactly. And then as you've spent all these the, this money and time and effort into these, these groups uh, and you get, you know, garbage data, right? Mm. Well, it's just a sense and feeling of belonging that's innate uh, sense within us to belong to a crowd. And if you're against it, some people may not have the um, the courage to stand up and be against it. So that's an yeah, interesting point on that. Get it. So interesting conversation fascinating conversation um and i think there'd be a lot of takeaways for people to understand this is there any material they can lean on to learn about themselves a little bit more and dig in on the especially the experience situational and the the rational and creative intuitions is this do you have some material that we can share out to everybody absolutely mm -hmm. so if, if people go to intuitionology.com mm -hmm. this is more on the personal side but it's yeah. the same i mean personal business does not matter there's a seven day challenge it's free by the way and you go into the seven day challenge. And what that does is it gets you to solve. Let's just look at one problem. Mm -hmm. And let's solve the problem. Let's take a look at your negative signals, your positive signals, yeah. who are you going to surround yourself with? Mm -hmm. And let's solve that one problem. Then you get a taste of what your intuition is and how it operates in, in just one problem. And I have two people that go through this case study with you. Uh, one fellow by the name of John Harris actually sold his house using the seven day challenge. Uh, and so on day one, he gets this real estate agent comes and throws a card in his face. Um, and he was, he's like a pushover as so he would have normally said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. 20,000 under asking. Sure, sure, sure. Let's do it. But again, his intuition was saying this, I don't trust this person. Let's wait. He surrounds himself with the right people. And then on day seven, he gets into a bidding war at 50,000 over asking price. Uh, that's a $70,000 jump. And so that's a $10,000 a day, seven day challenge winner. Um, the other person, um, her name's Ashley Michelle. She actually walked into her boyfriend's apartment after he murdered their best friend in a bathtub. Oh. Uh, he closes the door behind her. You've got some very interesting stories. <laughs> oh, <I'm> just, <laughs> just throw me in these conversations. Yeah, please. no, no problem. Okay. But uh, yeah, so he locks the door, puts a knife to her back and says, I'm already going away for one murder. Why as well make it two. So she gets choked. Her intuition calms her down, calms him down. And her, intu her intuition is looking for the moment of escape. But before that happens, he chokes her. He uh, assaults her a number of times. He uh, breaks a bunch of blood vessels in her neck. But the intuition picks up now, now, now. Got it. And she takes a beeline, uh, unlocks the door, runs 18 flights of stairs down. Um, and he and apparently he was looking after, he came running down after her and he missed her by seconds the second time. And, and there was a video camera showing that she leaves and seconds later he's looking for her out the elevator. Um, and so she obviously lived to tell the story. And she goes to the seven day challenge and she came from someone who couldn't even leave the apartment. Like she had <laughs> seven locks herself. And so she opens the door, she's looking. And so she takes the seven day challenge to get gets back into her intuitive signals. And so now she's able to go to the gym and now she's gone jogging. And when it comes to intuitive branding, where she's taken that and, and I've taken her under my wing. So she signed up for my intuitive branding coaching where I've taken her through a year long process. And we've gone from that, from walking into a dead body in a tub to now she's just released her website and a book on healing. And she sold thousands of books already on ashleymichelle.com. And she's writing blog after blog, video after video. And people are now coming to her for trauma and healing. Mm. Uh, and she was just texting me yesterday that somebody just got assaulted and, and she was going running off to go help uh, that person heal, right? And so now we've taken an something that, which is so traumatic from a business perspective. She's she, like, people love her. People are buying her book because of that message. Uh, you know, and now my team wants to work with her because they love that. It's like, oh my God, I love. So she's, she's pulling the employees. She's pulling the customers and people, she's now starting to get on podcasts because the marketplace mm -hmm. is loving her. It's, it's a, it's a traumatic experience and it's, yeah. People um, can connect to that. Help and, other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, you can trust from that experience that she would uh, 
consider everyone else in another way and understand, especially if they've been in similar situations. So, yeah, it, there is a that sort of grouping of um, similar thinking, similar situation can impact. Would agree with that. Mm. Fascinating. But we'll share we'll share some content out um, when we share the podcast out um, and share a little bit about you and how people can connect. What's the best way to connect to you? Um, uh, yeah, so I'm all over the socials, uh, yep. LinkedIn, Facebook. I've got uh, int- I've got two Instagram accounts. There's the Intuitive okay. Branding one and the, uh, the Intuitionology one. Um, I've got two YouTube channels. Uh, you can DM me. Uh, I've got my two podcasts. Um, I have a TikTok. I don't do any dancing, uh, <laughs> but I do offer some some more stuff on intuition. Um, on I just had one on on uh, the button about the Audi one. I had one on uh, how to sell, how to get me extra money on intuition just by asking. So just small nuggets of one minute pieces of uh, wisdom, um, just to get people to think about intuition, how they can use it as a tool to better their okay. lives. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm. I'm all over the place. So yeah, we'll share everything. Cool. Yeah, we'll share it the show notes. But thank you for joining us and coming on the podcast. So great to listen but to. Hopefully, people have got some insight into different ways of making decisions because sometimes we don't know how we make decisions. We just maybe go on what we call our gut, and in certain in- instances, but that's effectively what this is. But understanding ourselves a little bit better can enable us to progress a lot further, a lot quicker, a lot faster. So thanks for sharing. Really appreciate your time. No yeah. problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.